Um, good morning, everybody who has joined us so far. Uh, and thank you for uh, coming to this webinar on a Friday so late uh, in 2020. And thank you to Section 27, uh, the Department of Health, and Murray Hunter in particular. Uh, for uh, being willing to put on this seminar, this uh, this webinar, um, I'll introduce the participants in a second. Um, the purpose of of today's webinar is to launch a research report uh, written by Murray Hunter called "Track Trace Track and Trace Trial and Error: Assessing South Africa's Approaches to Privacy in the COVID-19." Uh, digital contact tracing, in COVID-19 digital contact tracing. And you can access that report if you look at the top of the chat box, there is a link to that report. We're using that report to help us to debate the interface between public health policy and in particular uh, uh, prevention and control of COVID-19 and privacy rights. Uh, and the reason for having this discussion is rooted in a decision uh, earlier this year by the Department of Health, by the government, to introduce digital contact tracing. So our focus is going to be on digital contract, contact tracing, its efficacy and how it synergizes uh, and doesn't undermine uh, uh, privacy uh, rights. I think it's a particularly important discussion because, as we know, uh, COVID-19 is far from behind us in South Africa. We're now contemplating the possibility of a resurgence uh, in certain parts of the country, and therefore contact tracing remains a critical part uh, of in our armory of prevention. We're very fortunate uh, to be joined in this discussion uh, by three experts uh, on the front line of this issue. Uh, Murray Hunter will kick off the discussion uh, with an introduction to his report. Murray is a communications consultant and digital rights uh, activist. Murray, as many of you may know, was a long time uh, member of the Right to Know campaign, uh, working on research and advocacy on state surveillance and security politics. Uh, he now works on communication surveillance for the media and policy uh, projects. So, so Murray will be our first speaker this morning. Uh, the second speaker will be Gorang Tana. Uh, Gorang, uh, good morning and thanks for joining us. Uh, Gorang, I think, is also very important to our discussion because he is the person in the National Department of Health uh, who is responsible uh, for this uh, area. He led the design and implementation of digital contact tracing system, both COVID Connect and COVID Alert, which you will hear much more about in the course of today. Uh, he's formally responsible for policy coordination and integrated planning at the department uh, and is a computer science uh, uh, specialist. So, so thank you, Gorang. It's actually great to have a a government official uh, to debate with uh, and to share ideas about how to do this, uh, th this best. And our third speaker uh, will be Avani Singh. Uh, Avani, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Uh, Avani is an attorney and will bring particularly the perspective uh, of the law and the constitution uh, to these, these, these questions. Um, she's the director and co-founder of Power Singh. She was previously a clerk at the Constitutional Court. She's appeared before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and the United Nations Human Rights Committee, and her area of specialization is information rights and media law, data privacy, and uh, pu public law. So really, I think, you know, we couldn't have a better uh, uh, collective of speakers to interrogate this question of uh, uh, privacy and digital uh, contact uh, tracing. Each speaker is going to speak for about 10 uh, minutes. Uh, after we've heard them, we will open up the conversation. Uh, we're very interested in your 
questions and comments, so please feel free to use the uh, chat line uh, throughout the course of this morning's uh, discussion. And at the end of uh, today, we will also make available a recording of this, uh, of this debate. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Murray Hunter to produce uh, today's discussion and uh, the report that we are, are launching. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Murray, over to you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I, yeah, thank you for hosting this. And I also thank you to, to Garang from the department to be part of this discussion, because I think it is a really important one. Um, you know, many people who have been following this would know that uh, uh, from the very early days of the, of the pandemic, the global pandemic, um, globally, part of the narrative was uh, that there was interest in digital contact tracing solutions. And uh, often those raised concerns around digital rights. And, and some of that is data protection um, uh, and privacy is, is obviously the one that we're focusing on. And so before we get started, I just wanted to say uh, um, uh, one or two things, which is the first is if, if there's one thing people need to hear, if this is a concern people have, um, the COVID alert app is not uh, being used to track your location. That's not, that's not a thing. So if you had one concern and you needed to leave now, uh, let that uh, let that be something you walk away with. Uh, and maybe the second disclaimer is that I'm not a, a, a public health expert, and if you hear me talking like one, um, maybe bear that in mind. Um, in the context of those, that global narrative I was speaking about, where there was, I think, um, real concern that COVID-19, the era of COVID-19 would essentially be uh, you know, I guess a time of, of really anti-democratic responses that, that are prompted by the emergency and, and, and raise, you know, almost like a surveillance nightmare. Um, the, the South African case doesn't follow that now. Um, and, you know, my background, as Mark has mentioned, is I'm, I'm part of a, of a group of activists that spend a lot of time thinking about a very different part of the state, which is the, the security agencies, very different institutional culture, very different uh, uh, instincts and impulses. And so as we look at how the South African health authorities approached, you know, this really unique set of challenges, I think it's worth reminding, you know, it, it, I, I think it really struck me that this is a story of, um, of really public officials working to address really complicated challenges in an unprecedented time and thinking very creatively and mindfully about the sorts of rights-based concerns that people were, were raising. Um, and, you know, globally, I don't know there's a case study we can point to to say, this is a place that's fixed these issues. This is a place that did it right. Uh, and in fact, in many parts of the world, we would look at COVID-19 responses that were, were, were absolute disasters. Um, and so uh, uh, this is not basically, I'm not coming on to bash health is, is what I'm trying to say. So the question is why, does, why is digital contact tracing even a thing? Um, and for anyone who, who has that question, uh, simply put contact tracing, which is identifying people who may have been exposed to, uh, to the virus uh, as quickly as possible to identify them and contact them so that they can uh, self-isolate, get tested, do all the other things necessary to ensure that they don't uh, potentially spread the illness onwards. Um, the, the, the thinking behind digital contact tracing is that because the virus spreads so quickly, the earlier you can intervene, uh, um, the better. And in fact, if, you know, if there's even a delay of two or three days of, of notifying and identifying contacts, uh, it can really, you know, it, it, it dramatically reduces how effective that is um, in containing the spread of the virus. And so, um, you know, a manual process of calling people up by a call center approach, for example, is fine when there's 50, or 100 cases being reported a day. But once it gets to 1,000 cases or 1,500 cases, next week it's going to be 2,000 cases a day. Clearly, that doesn't scale up. And so um, globally, that's why people have looked to these automated processes that can scale up. Um, and looking at how South Africa has approached that, uh, uh, that set of challenges, along with everyone else, learning as we go uh, has been a very instructive, um, very instructive for me. So I'm going to quickly, just because there's been a lot of uh, a lot of misreporting on this. Uh, I'm going to just share a, a timeline that comes from the research, which I think helps lay it out. So here we are in South Africa, uh, obviously uh, in the very early part of March, we have our first uh, confirmed cases. 
there's a state of disaster declared and then and later a lockdown. Um, from the 2nd of April, the first approach was announced, which was uh, that mobile location data from people's um, cell phone providers would be used to try to identify um, people's movements and to locate them uh, as part of a contact tracing process. And there were regulations issued about that. Um, this is not an approach that was unique to South Africa. It was experimented with in a few different places. Um, but in fact, it, is largely, it, it largely went unnoticed that the approach was, was shifted away from within six weeks. It, 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 you know, I think Garang would talk to this. It wasn't um, an effective approach. And so very quickly shifted to, to other responses. Um, now then within, by July, we uh, saw the launch of COVID Connect, which is a, a, a mass-based messaging platform using WhatsApp and bulk SMS. Garang will also talk to that. Uh, and then finally in September, we had the launch of the COVID Alert uh, app, which is a Bluetooth tracing app, which um, doesn't, as I said, track people's location or collect that kind of personal information that, that a lot of people are concerned about. Um, so that is really how it, how it all lays out. Um, and so what has been really interesting is a lot of, I think it was largely went unreported, uh, except by the way, in uh, Spotlight, the magazine of Section 27, that that early approach in April and May actually um, uh, was not ongoing. Uh, uh, as the uh, as the pandemic progressed across the country, um, now in the context, it's interesting to think that uh, South Africa was having this difficult uh, debate around privacy and data protection and and surveillance oversight, um, where you know the, the the security agencies within South Africa haven't exactly covered themselves in glory on this, um, and in fact, just literally weeks before the pandemic arrived in South Africa's shores. Our state surveillance law, RICA, was in front of the constitutional court around a range of abuses, around um, uh, 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 whether it would be constitutionally required for there to be more oversight and more checks and balances in that system. And so in that first South African approach, which was to use uh, uh, locational information that came from NTN and Vodacom, et cetera, um, yes, it didn't work uh, and, and, and it was shifted away from. But what was interesting is to see that the same uh, uh, government uh, that had been um, fighting the, the surveillance reforms in the constitutional court actually responded very thoughtfully to the kinds of privacy concerns that would have come up with a, a system that did collect people's uh, cellular location data. And so in April, we saw these quite interesting regulations issued as part of the Disaster Management Act, which essentially said, OK, we are going to try to access people's location data but uh, only for specific purposes, which is for contact tracing, um, only for a specific period of time, which is during the period of the state of disaster. Um, only people who've been identified either as having tested positive or, or believed to be positive with COVID-19 or people that they uh, uh, might have been exposed to. Um, and then that there would be an oversight system set in place. So a specially appointed judge, uh, uh, the former Constitutional Court Justice, um, Kate O'Regan, uh, would sit in oversight of the system and monitor uh, the extent to which privacy was protected. Um, and so these were really, I think, progressive and useful reforms. And, and really, in a time when policy was being made in a time of emergency, it was a very thoughtful response. And in, in some ways had oversight measures that were lacking from South Africa's existing uh, um, surveillance laws. And so that's something that I think is worth talking about. Now we've shifted away from that and we're looking at uh, um, uh, COVID Connect, the, the mass-based messaging platform and COVID Alert, which is the Bluetooth app. Garang's gonna get into that and so I won't uh, discuss it too much, um, except to say that they don't raise the same kinds of privacy concerns that, that we saw with the first response. But I think that the lesson to be drawn from uh, uh, how this has evolved is firstly that Emergency times can produce progressive uh, uh, measures like that. Not every crisis provokes an anti-democratic response that, that progressive policy is there. But secondly, to the extent that mistakes were made, that the system might not, the original system might not have actually been effective. Um, we need to remember that it was produced as a response of an emergency. So, so by default, it was necessarily a very quick, a very quickly built system. Uh, but as a result of that, it, it, it wasn't open to public discussion. There wasn't uh, a kind of external feedback, which might have 
tweaked the system, which might have improved the system, which might have identified um, uh, problems in the system. So that wasn't possible in March of 2020. Uh, but it means that as new approaches have been rolled out, I think it should be perhaps a cautionary tale to say, we, you know, we should slow down, we should investigate these things. And so um, I think it is very, it's, it's great to be having this discussion because it is time for us to slow down and say, okay, how are all these approaches working? What is their efficacy? Um, uh, uh, to the extent that there are regulations spelling out how they should work, um, you know, are, are, are the regulations working? And so bringing out a lot of public information that just helps us understand these things is quite necessary. Um, yeah, and I think that, 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 you know, as we are looking at a system that was built really to last three months, the, the, you know, the, the, the Disaster Management Act uh, regulations, as we're heading into the 10th month, the 11th month, and we know that this is actually really a new normal, I think this is really a time for us to start to flesh out what some of the lingering data protection concerns are, what some of these nuances are. Uh, and, um, you know, to some extent, it, it can't only be the work of health to have these conversations. We need to see that happening in Parliament. We see, need to see oversight bodies like the information regulator having it. And I think a public and informed discussion as well is very necessary. Um, and so I, I've spoken for my 10 minutes plus, Mark, and I, I'll be happy to hand over. And I really do look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Murray. Uh, that was really useful uh, in setting up this discussion. It's also really good, uh, given what we know of the many areas where there were human rights violations uh, associated with aspects of the lockdown, to hear of an instance uh, where an independent uh, activist can say, as you did, that government responded thoughtfully uh, and with concern uh, for people's privacy uh, rights. So, so thank you very much, and thank you for helping us on the road to an informed discussion, as you say, about these issues. I'm now going to pass over uh, to Garang to uh, uh, bring the Department of Health perspective uh, into this, and we will come back, Murray, to some of your uh, comments and concerns uh, in the course of the discussion uh, later on. Garang, uh, over to you, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Mark, and uh, good morning uh, to everyone on the on the webinar. Um, so, just additional context um, and something some of this we may all be familiar with, um, but really to combat 19 and uh, to combat, combat COVID-19 and break the chains of transmission, the health system has to respond quickly, detect positives, trace concept, context, isolate positives, uh, and, quarant and request quarantine on the context. Um, the population needs to play its part and really implement the non-pharmaceutical interventions, uh, physical distancing, hygiene, wearing masks, um, and those that are diagnosed positive need to uh, take agency and isolate themselves uh, in close context, need to quarantine themselves. Um, and, and really, uh, at this juncture, we need to guard against a national resurgence. So we are seeing a flare up in a few provinces and a few cities particularly. Uh, we really need to guard our economy and our health system. Um, and so digital contact tracing now more than before probably plays an even more important role um, and um, one thing WHO has taught us is that um, w digital contact tracing uh, augments the efforts by healthcare workers and doesn't necessarily replace it. Um, so we've in South Africa, um, as Mari pointed out, uh, have implemented uh, two modalities, um, the COVID Connect, which is a service um, uh, more than an app. It's, it runs off SMS and WhatsApp. Um, it essentially digitizes an otherwise a very labor intensive process. It provides uh, health guidance uh, through WhatsApp. So many of you would remember that very early on in the pandemic, um, the uh, national health system started up a WhatsApp channel uh, to, uh, to be an, author um, an authorized source of receiving true information about COVID-19. There was a lot of misinformation um, and really uh, COVID Connect 
uh, then extended this um, to actually uh, provide a facility that allows healthcare workers uh, to communicate with patients and patients to communicate with healthcare workers. And that's really where the name COVID Connect comes from. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about what they do, the pros and the cons, the strengths and limitations in a bit. Uh, with COVID Alert, uh, it's, a, it's a mobile app-based uh, system. Uh, it uh, works on the base in, on Bluetooth, like many other countries have implemented, um, and it really improves contact tracing processes as lockdowns ease. Um, with global experience uh, contact tracing, we know that many countries have implemented many, many different modalities so what you see on the far uh, right and top corner are some of the methods that Vietnam has implemented, for example. Um, the bottom right hand corner, which is fairly faint, um, is really a list of countries that have actually implemented uh, Bluetooth based uh, mobile app uh, uh, contact tracing uh, or taken on mo mobile based uh, Bluetooth contact tracing approaches. And there have been really two types of approaches that countries have implemented uh, a centralized uh, uh, reporting uh, process where all the data collected uh, with a location potentially gets stored in a central database uh, and is used by the public health uh, authorities to do contact tracing or a decentralized approach that is built on the back of Apple and Google's exposure notification framework which guarantees uh, uh, privacy and confidentiality uh, and, and an approach that South Africa has actually settled on there are very few things Google and Apple collaborate on, and this was one of the things that they chose to collaborate on. And so we were lucky enough to be implementing this at a time when uh, the exposure notification framework was available for us to use. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, we're probably the first country in Africa to have implemented it. Um, the, the National Contact Tracing Program uh, has three channels. There's a manual process that's uh, largely dominated by calls and home visits, the uh, uh, COVID Connect process, which I spoke about, uh, where an index case is sent an SMS once the uh, lab result is available to do case investigation, share re lab results, um, as well as uh, offer the positive patient the ability to uh, declare contacts uh, and notify their contacts anonymously. Now, this is great because it doesn't require um, you know, anybody to download anything additional, as long as they have WhatsApp and SMS on their phone works great. We know in South Africa, close on to two thirds of our population use WhatsApp. And so uh, was a great, uh, has been a great tool to get the reach uh, uh, and get the scale required for this. Um, however, the, the limitation with this is that, like with manual contact tracing, uh, is that it it only works for reported contacts. So we, we would not be able to derive any contacts. Uh, with COVID Alert um, is a Bluetooth based uh, uh, application that constantly polls other app users within its proximity. As Soon as it finds another app user less than two meters for more than 15 minutes, it essentially uh, uh, exchanges randomized codes that remain on your phone until they required uh, uh, to be uploaded for notifying others should either of those people turn positive. Now, on the manual contact tracing side, you know, the strength is it reaches people without phones, allows for uh, counseling, directed assistance. The limitation, however, is it's really dependent on the extent of human capacity or human capital we have in the health system, uh, which we know uh, many, many health systems globally have struggled with and therefore the urgency uh, and the need to... Uh, to use digital contact tracing methods. The, the presentation will largely focus or exclusively focus on the digital aspects of contact tracing. And so for COVID Connect, the strength was it was rapid, it's rapid, it's anonymized, notification of contacts does not require intervention by the health teams. Uh, uptake is monitored by the district health teams. The limitation that it requires the users have to have access to WhatsApp may be ignored by receivers, uh, relies on accurate capture of cell phone number by the person um, collecting specimen. Uh, and, and as you can see, every additional modality uh, enhances that our ability to do contact tracing. So with the COVID alert app, 
we were now able to derive context. So uh, um, as soon as the app finds another app user within 15 minutes of range, it would be able to log a, a, a record of this person, uh, an, an anonymized record, should I uh, mention. Um, so should either of those people uh, diagnose positive several days later, uh, they're able to notify each other because people meeting in supermarkets or banks or whatever would not be able to exchange contact details, but would have been a close contact to each other or may have been. Um, the limitation, however, here is that it requires user to download the app, to have a smartphone, to inform the app uh, that he is positive, uh, but, benef uh, and benefits, but, but does benefit at a population level. Um, COVID Connect uh, and COVID Alert partially, uh, to some extent, works excellently uh, only if the people testing for COVID-19, whether at a public or a private lab, um, provides a correct cell number. So we need to ensure that everybody who tests for COVID-19 provides a correct cell number, otherwise the system cannot communicate. Um, and also, um, uh, we cannot offer monitoring support electronically and, and, and the rest of the services that go with it. Uh, we need a correct address uh, for surveillance purposes, uh, isolate while, uh, the guidance we are giving people is that they should isolate while waiting for their test results so they don't spread the virus without knowing it. Um, and the, the critical thing is then they need to wait for the SMS message with the WhatsApp link uh, that they can use uh, to engage COVID Connect and a separate SMS would be sent with a PIN code, which I'll talk about in a moment. But essentially COVID Connect has got three users, uh, uh, health promotion information, uh, a health assessment, so you can do a screening uh, if you suspect you have COVID, um, testing, um, if you're testing for COVID, you'd be able to offer, we'd be able to offer you lab results. Uh, and if you were a contact, you, you'd be notified if you were close contact, should the person that was positive have notified uh, the health system through the WhatsApp process. Uh, some numbers, um, more than 5 million SMS messages dispatched to date, including reminder messages, uh, against 2.1 million test results uh, offered. Uh, with an engagement rate of about 10% negatives and 22% for positives, so one in four successfully engage. This number has been progressively, has been uh, uh, volatile across provinces, but we, we are seeing a slightly lower uh, lower adoption recently. On the health promotion front, the WhatsApp line 0600123456 has been active uh, since mid-March, more or less, uh, has had more than 8 million unique users uh, 9.6 million risk assessments or, or screenings or health checks have been done by more than 2 million people. Uh, <clears throat> on the COVID alert front, uh, there's uh, uh, so a lot of time people ask, what? why do I need to download this? Um, well, the reason is you can't be alerted if you don't have the app. So firstly, you need the app to be alerted by others. And secondly, you need the app to alert others. And so and the greater number of people that uses the better it is. There are two main concerns that people have had. The one is battery drainage. Um, it uses Bluetooth low energy protocol and so wouldn't uh, significantly drain your battery and people shouldn't be concerned about that. It, it doesn't, it's uh, all the information is private. In fact, no personal information is collected. Uh, it's all anonymized uh, and you have no data cost. So it's free to use after download. Uh, we've ne uh, The mobile network operators have been uh, courteously granting us this for free. Uh, I'm not going to go through too much detail here. We're going to share the presentation just to mention that um, as at 1st December, more than a million people have downloaded this app. Uh, just under a thousand people have uh, shared the positive diagnosis and on average between two and three exposure notifications have been sent. Uh, so we really need everybody to play their part, download the app, we have a few links here that people can use to watch videos of on YouTube to understand more on how this app works. But really, uh, our message here is um, we need uh, we need the greater population of South Africa to download this app. Uh, they don't need to be worried about data or their battery um, or their privacy. Uh, it's all protected. Um, so it's not a trade-off between the two. You've only got something to offer once you download it uh, to the public health system. There's a direct correlation between breaking the chains of transmission or reducing incidence of COVID-19 admissions and mortality or deaths. Uh, so the fewer the cases, uh, the, the less the impact on the public health system 
and 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 a few dates. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, Garang, and that was very very helpful uh, and very very informative. Um, we're going to move straight on, but we've noted some questions. You've answered some. For example, there was one question: How many people have downloaded COVID Connect? And you said uh, over a million people uh, have downloaded it. Uh, there's another question on how many people uh, originally loaded it, have uninstalled it. And then there's an important question from Dr. Sham Moodley, uh, which we will come to. Dr. Moodley, I've noted the question uh, because it is an important issue about how this data can be accessed uh, beyond government uh, to assist communities and other professionals with COVID-19 uh, prevention. We, we, we note all of those uh, th those questions. I, I would ask uh, uh, Garang, you know, what is what what is an anonymized record? Um, just to break that down uh, for us, because we don't all necessarily understand what what you mean by that. What an anonymized record looks like uh, and how it's protected. But we will come back to that, uh, and I'm sure some of these issues of Vani uh, Singh will touch on as well. So. Uh, I'm now moving over to our third uh, speaker before we go into the conversation, Avani Singh, an attorney who is going to interrogate what we've heard so far from the perspective of rights to privacy uh, and so on. Thank you very much, Avani. Over to you. Thanks, Mark, uh, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I'm going to be looking at this from a privacy lens, um, which is really the focus of a lot of my work. Um, and just to start, I think it's really important to understand privacy in the broader context of its importance. I think increasingly we're coming to recognize that privacy is central to questions of identity, autonomy, decision making, um, and more and more we're starting to build awareness over the importance of the right to privacy. Um, so I love the little tweet on the right hand side um, that's um, just a very cute illustration of how, you know, at a young age, people are, are coming to realize that personal information about themselves is really central to who they are um, and how they protect that information. And increasingly, we're seeing a demand by the public um, to have agency over their personal information. So at the core of the right to privacy is a constitutional protection in Section 14 that guarantees every person the right to privacy. Um, and we're starting to see legislative effects uh, being given to this, particularly through the Protection of Personal Information Act, which protects personal information, so information that identifies individuals. Um, and although the legislation only becomes um, enforceable from the 1st of July next year, it's still a useful framework for us to understand the context in which personal information through contact tracing measures are being taken and implemented. And as Mari's already mentioned, in South Africa, we've had a bit of a checkered record of the protection of personal information and privacy more generally, both through um, surveillance measures in the long delay in seeing the Protection of Personal Information Act coming into force um, and various measures that have really hampered the full realization of this right. So when we talk about personal information, we're talking about various pieces of information that can be used to identify a particular person. Um, and in particular, I think the uh, composite collection of personal information that can create quite a holistic picture of who the person is, what they like, what they do, um, and sometimes the accuracy of how we triangulate that information can create inaccurate pictures, which is even more concerning. Um, so we're talking about things like contact details, identity numbers, biometric information, but also things like location information, personal preferences, and so on. And so in the contact tracing framework, as Murray has discussed already and as Gar Garang has touched on, um, we've seen various protections built into the legislation, into the regulations, and into the, the framework as well. And what's quite interesting about that is that the contact tracing framework has therefore put in place heightened protections than the average person enjoys um, in privacy regulation outside of this particular framework, such as, for example, user notification. And while the app itself, so the COVID alert app, doesn't appear to collect personal information, which I think is, is a really positive development, 
there are broader considerations in the context of contact tracing that do give rise to concerns about data protection um, more broadly. And then I think, in, and I, I appreciate the conversation here is primarily on digital contact tracing, but I think the, the range of contact tracing measures that we're seeing in South Africa include, for example, paper-based contact tracing, where when you enter a particular building or um, uh, want to access a particular service, you have to fill out a range of personal information, your name, your contact details, your address, in some instances, your ID number. Um, and that that has been used to control access to certain facilities. I think one of the most stark examples of this is the Health Check app, which is being used by the department or being promoted by the Department of um, Higher Education um, to control access to higher education facilities. And here, um, it's not anonymized. Um, so you are asked to provide quite a bit of personal information, including your cell phone number, your address, and other pieces of personal information um, before you're able to access that um, a university campus. And so on this slide, when we think about contact tracing, um, perhaps outside of the app specifically, but um, what we need to recognize is that there's now, both through the manual contact tracing um, processes and through the uh, digital processes that are feeding into the database of information, um, there are a number of pieces of information that are being collected and some of it's very sensitive personal information. And that for anybody who's been involved in um, a data protection training or anything on Poppy, you'll know that at the center of the framework that Poppy creates is our eight conditions for the lawful processing of personal information. Um, and I just want to touch on a couple of these um, for us to kind of frame the discussion around what the data, what the key requirements are. Um, so for example, there has to be a valid ground of justification where you can collect or process personal information. And that can be consent, for example, but there are other instances of it. You need a clear and specific purpose for collecting that information. And that goes to a broader question about how the information being collected will be shared um, with other departments or agencies. Because if, for example, it's being collected um, at a healthcare facility or by a higher education institution using the Health Check app, um, that information can only be used for that service for that very particular purpose and not shared more broadly unless you have a valid uh, ground of justification to do so. There are big questions around the period of retention, so how long information can't be stored for longer than is necessary to achieve the particular purpose. Um, and that I think is, is quite important um, when we discuss how long the personal information in the, in the database is being kept for, um, particularly through the manual contact tracing per, uh, processes and other services, for example, WhatsApp and other uh, services that are feeding into this database. Um, security is a huge consideration. So making sure that the, there are appropriate, um, uh, reasonable technical and organizational measures to ensure that the information is not um, unlawfully accessed or um, shared or disseminated. And, and we've seen a number of instances recently where security measures are being um, breached, not just by complex techniques such as hacking or uh, anything of the sort, but by either human error um, or um, dishonesty, where some an individual within who has access to personal information is actively sharing that information for a profit um, or for some other untoward purpose. Um, and access, I think, is a very critical um, uh, consideration because um, in terms of the Protection of Personal Information Act, there is a, a right um, to have access to information that's held about you. So if, for example, through a contact tracing measure, your contact details have been shared um, with uh, the Department of Health, with a community health worker, um, through an app um, or some, uh, through WhatsApp, for example. In principle, if the Protection of Personal Information Act were in force, you should be able to um, understand who has been given access to that personal information, for what purpose, and who that information is being shared with. Um, and I think it's going to be really interesting to understand um, as we go forward, how these principles are being implemented. Um, so I think as we um, 
and I, I don't want to take too much time because I, I know we're running short on time. I just want to touch on a couple of the key lessons that I think we've drawn out of this process um, and what we've learned so far from understanding these um, contact tracing measures within the context of the right to privacy. And I think just to echo what Mario said, I think it's a really positive development that the Department of Health has really sought and tried hard uh, to make sure that privacy was a key consideration um, in developing certain measures. But I do think there's more work that can be done. And one of the biggest lessons I think that we've learned is that there's a fundamental need for an effective privacy framework in South Africa, um, which Poppy takes us part of the way there. But I think a 2013 piece of legislation that's based you know, on a 1995 EU directive is potentially already out of date, um, even though it's not yet in force. And there's a lot more work that needs to be done, um, particularly when we're dealing with very sensitive information, such as information about health and so on. I think one of the biggest lessons we've learned as well is the need for better coordination. Um, so there's been a lot of mixed messaging, mixed messaging around contact tracing in South Africa. It's taken um, quite a bit of time to unpack the different measures and understand where contact tracing currently stands in the country, um, how it's being given effect, um, and how the, these measures, whether they're effective or not. Um, and I think the mixed, the, the different departments having come out with different measures, some of which have since been repealed, um, was concerning and a little bit uh, and added to the complexity of an already quite complex discussion. I think oversight has been another key lesson. So the lack of involvement of the information regulator, for example, is something that has been of concern for privacy advocates. Um, and there's a, a deeper conversation about why the information regulator wasn't seen as a key player in these discussions. Communication and trust is fundamental. So I think these kinds of conversations that we're having today are really useful and it's great to have the Department of Health explain um, the measures that have been put into place. But I think there's a big question around people not being sure whether they can trust the app, for example, and not being sure whether they can share the, that information and what protections are in place. Um, and then I think what we've learned as well is that digital solutions aren't a silver bullet. Um, there, there are very useful benefits to it, but it can't replace um, other measures and needs to be complemented by more traditional measures as well. And I think that comes down to questions of, for example, language, given that the app is only in English, the cost, the availability of devices, and we need to have equal consideration across the different measures. And then lastly, just to say that we've allowed a lot of leeway, um, I think in the face of a, uh, of a health crisis, um, where there's been a lack of consultation and oversight and going forward, we need to make sure that we, what we don't see is regulatory creep into the privacy spectrum. So I'm gonna leave it there, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ivani. That was uh, very, very helpful coming after the other two presentations to help us uh, know how to frame these issues uh, in law and rights. Um, I've noted a, a question from Anri as well, and I'm going to come to that. and. Uh, also to the, the, the earlier question by Dr. Moodley. But I, I want to ask you all three a question that uh, arises from uh, uh, something uh, that was said just now uh, by Avani, which is Murray told us how in the first attempt at digital contact tracing, uh, a judge was brought in uh, to have oversight, independent oversight, Judge Cato Reagan. I, I presume that Judge Cato Reagan's role fell away when that initial attempt was abandoned, or am I mistaken? And so my question is to, to each of you very briefly, what independent oversight is there now of, of COVID Connect or COVID Alert or, 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 or of DBE uh, uh, app that uh, was mentioned by Avani? And, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, specifically to Lugarang, you know, Avani raised this question of lack of involvement of the information regulator. Um, you seem to have done very well by yourselves as the Department of Health uh, in, in being sensitive to privacy issues. But why, for example, have, have, has the information regulator not been brought in? Um, uh, 
can we start perhaps with you, Garang, and then I'll ask Murray and then Avani, and really keep keep responses uh, quite tight, please. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> you know, this the contact tracing uh, from what I've learned uh, with implementation uh, is is that it's it's bound to be a dilemma between privacy and uh, health uh, systems response and containment efforts. Um, we have a we also have a very heterogeneous population, and so you know. The policy making process as well as program implementation process is, is very, very complex. Um, in, in, and I think the third twist to this is uh, the note that uh, Murray made at the onset is being able to do it quickly, being able to do it at scale, uh, and being able to do it in the least intrusive way as possible. So we believe that with this, with these two technologies, uh, in play currently, um, that probably holds true. Um, the the information that we get that is processed by COVID Connect comes from a positive diagnosis of COVID-19, which, by the way, has its grounds in the notifiable medical conditions regulations. So COVID-19 is a notifiable medical condition. It's a uh, it's something that must be reported to NICD and much like uh, some of the other diseases. Uh, and so um, it's probably, uh, you know, largely grounded in that. Uh, and so, um, we, you know, we've had to do, we've had to ensure that this, this, uh, this dilemma is dealt with most appropriately. Uh, the second thing that's worth mentioning is that there were also ethical considerations around uh, can we share a positive diagnosis on SMS and WhatsApp and how secure would it be and would the right person get it? And so we built in a few checks and balances. So if you, any of you uh, that may have tested in the, in the, in the private laboratories, you may have just receive an open text SMS telling you of your positive diagnosis. Whereas what COVID Connect has done to ensure that ethical aspects of the system, uh, eth ethical considerations are, are, are incorporated, we had to ensure that on we, what we don't do is uh, disclose the status on SMS, but rather offer the result uh, and let the validation happen through WhatsApp. So as soon as we find that a number and the date of birth match, we give it to the patient. And so uh, that's just one example, but we've tried to put in as many checks and balances as possible now in the interest of time without going through each one. Um, I'd like to say that. Um, you know, the language is the cost and access to phones is always a, a, a major thing in South Africa, you know, head, with any heterogeneous population. Um, we've had to try and figure out what works best uh, at the speed desired and is it cost effective for what we do. We don't, uh, as a health system, we also don't have infinite amount of resources and we've got to rationalize and see how best to use those as far as possible. And just to give you an idea um, that we thought, for example, uh, COVID Connect's adoption would be poorer in Eastern Cape than it may be in Western Cape uh, because of the language barrier. And we were very worried at the onset. And uh, Western Cape was the first province to go online. Uh, in the first week of June, we ran a proof of concept in the city of Cape Town, given their peak at the time. Uh, and we thought we we're going to get a lower adoption rate in Eastern Cape. We were proven quite dismally wrong. We have saw in Eastern Cape uh, up to... Uh, one third of uh, one in three people engaging on COVID Connect, whereas in Western Cape, we saw one in five, one in four at times. And so, you know, what we thought was actually a major barrier was actually not a major barrier in Eastern Cape, for example. Um, um, and I'll stop here. Thanks. Mark, it's 2020 and you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, my apologies. My apologies. I, I want thanks, Garang. Helpful. I want to move to Murray, but just one specific question because it may uh, help his answer as well. Uh, Avani said, you know, question why the information regulator hasn't been brought in involved in any of this. Can you give us a a a, a thirty second answer to that? Um, I don't have an answer to that. Um, um, I don't have an answer to that, and I'll and I'll be honest in saying this because uh, and. So the, the contact tracing regulations themselves refer to what the governance system would work like. And I think Murray alluded to the fact that Justice Kate O'Regan was entrusted to provide oversight there. 
And so my assumption is that she would bring in the necessary parties as they required. Over. Okay. So, right. So, Thank so, you. Could I give you a thirty-second question because I would want to do my country duty here for the Department of Health, which is that it's not the Department of Health's problem. Um, right. The system we have is a pretty good oversight system that recognizes the fact that the information regulator is not able to provide this quality of oversight. That's my frank view. I really uh, hope it doesn't hurt the feelings of you know of of the office there. Um, but the reality is that this is a this is a, actually not a bad kind of oversight system that has been duct taped together in recognition of the fact that data protection oversight is essentially uh, uh, exists only on paper uh, as it as it currently stands. So the information regulator missing in action. Uh, Parliament is missing in action. The fact is, uh, you know, th that this is not this should not be the first time that these discussions are happening, um, and uh, and it's not the Department of Health's issue that the, these discussions aren't happening in Parliament, as an example. Um, and and to answer the question, the, the, the uh, yes, uh, as as um, Garang said, uh, Kate O'Regan still sits. The regulations are actually essentially still intact, and and a lingering issue is that. The powers that we discussed in April, May, um, the policy has shifted away from that, but actually those powers around use of location data still exist in the regulations and, and aren't being used, uh, which is good. But, um, uh, and, and the judge does have some oversight, system, uh, oversight over uh, the service providers and apps and, you know, the, and the kind of compliance there, but also uh, over the shutting down the eventual shutting down of this massive database of, of user data, the judge is also meant to oversee how that gets shut down and the data destroyed or anonymized. Um, but it does also point to the fact that, that the regulations have been produced kind of iteratively, but we're now in a position where we've actually got more invasive regulations than the practice that, you know, than the existing practices and, and they should be rationalized and updated. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Avani, I'm sure you've got something to say, but, but let me throw in as well. You may or may not know this, but, but do we know how the judge operates? Is, is the judge triggered by a, by a concern or a complaint, or does she have constant access to what is going on? Are reports provided to her periodically so that she can assess? I found the, the, that position of the, the jug, judge fairly invisible maybe it should be invisible but uh, um but avani if you, if you can answer that question but also my earlier question about independent oversight uh, and perhaps linking it to your point about coordination as well because we're talking about the department of health here but you've shown us how this issue goes beyond just the department yes i think you know so my understanding, and Murray might know better because of his conversation with Justice O'Regan, um, my understanding is that Justice O'Regan has been very involved in the process. Um, you know, there, there has been active um, investigations and reports prepared to the extent that that's, you know, there's reporting to Parliament. I think there's a huge um, question, not just from Justice O'Regan, but from the different government departments who are involved in this process. and. I think that those reports need to be interrogated quite, you know, need to be made public and need to be interrogated quite closely, not just from a privacy perspective in and of itself, but also for us to understand the linkage between where privacy is being limited, the utility of these measures in a public health response. Um, so to assess whether or not this limitation of the right to privacy was in fact achieving the purpose um, when we try and assess the balancing of the different rights. Um, and so, Mark, I think that, you know, I, I fully agree with what, what, what Mario has said, that the regulate, the information regulator perhaps hasn't had the opportunity yet to stand up and show its, its real meat. And so this measure is, having Justice O'Regan is a fantastic measure, um, but it's, I, I don't think it's efficient. Um, I think that there is a lot more work that needed to be done and could still be done to the extent that this is an ongoing process for however long COVID is with us. Um, where we start to see a lot better public communication of these measures and oversight um, from the different um, stakeholders who are involved. Thanks, thanks. That's very helpful. And you raised the question, it's ongoing for how long COVID is with us. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question. And, and I guess one of the concerns is, is what happens post-COVID, if there is such a thing as, as post-COVID, both with the technology and it's how it's utilized as well as with the with, with, with the data 
Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm very conscious of time and I might allow, beg five minutes over time uh, at the end of this because important questions are being asked. You know, uh, Salia raises the important point that the sad part is that most people are not aware of their, their rights, which I think is, is very true. And, and, uh, and Siki has raised points about uh, communication and public understanding of, of, of these things. I must say, I'd never thought about it in the way uh, Avani put it, that you know, what happens if I decide I don't want to give my ID uh, over when I try to enter a public building, but I'm prepared to accept all other uh, uh, requirements in terms of mask wearing, uh, disclosure if I've had uh, any uh, uh, contacts with people. There, there are big questions. I want to go though back to uh, uh, Garang because there's two specific questions. Um, Garang, one is uh, a more technical question. Uh, globally, people seem to have different target rates for what proportion of the population needs to use a digital contact tracing response to be effective. Uh, I've seen figures ranging from 60 to 80%. Do you have a target for South Africa? Given that only about 54% of the population is online, that's one question. Uh, the second question uh, was the question raised by Dr. Sham Moodley. Um, uh, will be great for those in a practice area to be able to source aggregated data to look at the trend. It allows to prepare strategies in the events of surges. Currently, the HCP and community leaders use a WhatsApp platform to share info in Durban South Basin. Do, do you share aggregate data? I mean, the, the, the data you collect is, is a broader uh, uh, value to me to know as I go on holiday where there may be areas of very high incidence of COVID-19, uh, for example. If you can take those two questions, they're big questions, but I want succinct answers, and then I'm going to come back to Avani and, and Murray with a couple of things. Great. So on the uh, data, uh, NICD's website is... Uh providing updated numbers uh, daily on their website by district, by province. I think the district numbers are updated every week or something. I, I stand to be corrected. Um, on the issue of um, the uh, eff efficacy of the app, so um, I think the 60 to 80 percent is right, but there's a caveat to this, and the caveat is that 60 to 80 percent necessarily doesn't have to be at a national level. So we know, given the heterogeneity of our population, if you have, uh, for example, if you're in a in a in a uh, in a supermarket and you have 100 people in a supermarket, 20 or 30 of them have an app on their phone, it would work fairly well. Um, but if you're the only one in the entire supermarket with the app on uh, on your phone, then probably makes very little sense and will definitely not work. Um, the MIT studies, uh, so the big uh, data institute at Oxford has done a number of uh, studies on this, on the modeling exercises, uh, and they seem to suggest that you can get effectiveness from as little as 10 to 15 percent, and no country in the world has been able to reach 60 percent. Uh, so um, why I thought I'd give this context is uh, to share a number. We in, Our initial target is, uh, is, about, uh, is, is 5 million, but we hope that we're able to get to uh, 10 million uh, downloads uh, on the app. Um, and, and that's really just uh, uh, just what we wish for. Um, uh, South Africans really have to come to the party and help us get there. It is an important containment measure. They don't have to choose between privacy and, and help us contain the disease. Um, so we, we really make this plea that uh, they go and download the app. Uh, just to say, Mark, no user registration is required when they download the app. The app works quite virtuously. Over. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I see our conversation is just heating up, just as we're beginning to run out of time. But there's a question, uh, maybe uh, again, uh, Murray, or will the information regulator intervene where privacy rights are compromised before the end of the Popia grace period? Uh, Andrew comments on his personal experience. Uh, at a hospital. Uh, uh, you can read that in the chat. Uh, Kanye asks, uh, I'm curious to know as to who owns data information when its source has been public. This track and track tracing as compared to DHIS, I'm not quite sure. 
can you what you meant by DHIS? I understand the District Health Information System. Um, and Siki, are there plans to use this app for contact tracing initiatives in the future? And what implications does this have for the rights of disclosure and pr privacy, particularly for something like HIV, which is not a notifiable medical condition? Uh, that's a, a question from Nsiki. So I, I think I've captured those questions. Uh, it's now past 12. What I suggest we do is just allow each speaker a few minutes to put what you consider the, the key pertinent questions. What I've appreciated from this webinar is we could have done with two hours uh, and we could do with an ongoing public discussion about these issues, but perhaps we've, we've, we've started uh, uh, that discussion. But I'm going to go uh, um, Murray, uh, Garang, uh, Avani. Uh, I, I'll, I'll let the lawyer and the, the human rights activists have the last uh, uh, word. But Murray, first of all, to you, what do you think are the key issues? You talked in your initial input that although you, you know, your critical assessment had, had yielded a positive result, you said you had lingering data protection concerns. Uh, uh, what are your concerns perhaps going forward uh, at this moment in time and how do we, 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 we deal with that? Look, I think it absolutely has to be understood that this is not, you know, this is not about bad intentions or, or uh, um, any kind of cynical behavior, because I think it's very clear that, that health officials have dealt with this problem with seriousness uh, uh, and in good faith. Um, but there's, these are complex, this is a complex question. So the, the COVID alert app is, is one thing. I think COVID, uh, COVID connect, which is a much bigger, um, uh, kind of intervention involving lots more people and involves the use of a lot more information is more complicated. So we have, it's a system that runs, as I understand it, off of, of at least three service providers, um, uh, Prairie Health Foundation, uh, GovChat and, and, uh, a telecom subsidiary to do the SMSs. Um, so these are service providers which we presume have had to scale up their size a great deal this year in order to respond to these kinds of things. Perhaps they're using contractors. Um, and this is not about, you know, th these are systems being built very quickly. We don't really have a good understanding of what's happening in there. Are all the contractors signing their uh, uh, non-disclosure agreements? Are they all complying? Uh, in the regulations, it says that in fact, every two weeks, the Department of Health should get a report from them saying exactly who amongst those service providers has accessed the data uh, and um, so that there's that kind of oversight. And it may well be that that is happening. Um, but I think that it's, it's an example of a situation where with the best of intentions, people are moving very quickly. We need to slow down and have, as you said, a much longer conversation. I think this is a, an opportunity for the Department of Health um, to start to put that information out there. It would be great if the information regulator um, uh, starts to, to become active in this. It would be great if other oversight bodies and, 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 and parliament would start to become active in this as well. Uh, because as I said, it's, it's, it, everyone should care about data protection, but the Department of Health's first priority has to be public health. Uh, and it would be nice if, you know, and data protection is a part of that, but it requires external bodies uh, and external information to really flesh out the complexity of what we're talking about. So we understand what happens next year. We understand what happens in the next crisis. Um, because uh, uh, the emergency is no longer a three month emergency. This is, as we said, a, a much longer fight. And people mustn't put their faith only in the app, wear a mask and, uh, uh, and avoid uh, large gatherings and all that other stuff. Because as Goring says, it, it does really require people to change their behavior um, in order to fight, uh, you know, I think in order to save lives. Thank you, Murray, and thank you, too, for the report that you produced and uh, kind of putting this issue much more squarely uh, into the public domain for, for discussion. Uh, much appreciated for the work uh, that you've done. Garang. Thanks. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Murray that more has to be done and we can definitely improve. We've had to learn fast and learn quickly and just add a caveat to the timeline that Murray has put out. Um, uh, I will let the development of this particular COVID Connect instance of extending the screening aspect to contact tracing round about first week of May. We went live in Western Cape, city of Cape Town, the first week of June. In four weeks, we had to do back end integration between systems. We had to set up governance arrangements. We had to sign up, you know, uh, 
service providers. We had to ensure that there was funding available for this. Um, so, um, you know, a colleague of mine who worked at the NICD, his famous quote is, every pandemic leaves a legacy behind. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat about this that I want to talk about, and I think the question is, do we have an intention for using this for anything else to enhance those programs? Yes, certainly. I think if you look at if you look at global, uh, if you look at WHO building blocks, uh, health systems and health innovations have played a tremendous role in improving coverage and quality of care globally. Um, so I I think it would be uh, silly not to leverage the assets we have built now. Uh, of course, with careful considerations um, um, to to actually benefit other programs, TB, HIV, non-communicable diseases. You know, they, these these can be significantly enhanced if we did this. So, no doubt in my mind that uh, it would be the right thing to actually leverage these assets we've built. Um, but I agree with Murray that more can be done. Uh, more can be done quickly. Uh, more can be uh, for a few more considerations can be given when we're making decisions. But I think at the time of pandemic, with a constrained health system, uh, you know, with uh, Western Cape at the time seeing its peak, uh, we saw a national peak in, 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 in the country in July, Mark, at the time when we were launching this, we're seeing a second wave now. So, you know, um, I think in, in, in retrospect, you can definitely do things differently, but I certainly think as a health system, we've done what we could to, uh, to, to save lives. Thanks, Garang. And thank you, too, for, for helping us all today with your input. Thank you for being very accessible. Uh, I forgot to mention you've been 14 years at the Department of Health, but it's great to meet a government official who is open and accessible and, and available. So thank you for what you're doing and for all of your efforts uh, in this epidemic, uh, putting your brain to work on devising these apps and making them useful. Uh, for human rights and 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 uh, people's protection. So so thank you, Avani. Uh, you get the last word uh, on on our discussion today. Thanks, Mark. And I think the last thing I want to say is just that we have a need to change the narrative around the right to privacy. So I think for a long time people treated it as a right to exercise if you had something to hide, if you wanted to, I don't know, do something untoward. I think it's not received the attention that it's needed and. With the Protection of Personal Information Act coming into force, I think it's now being treated as a compliance exercise. And we need to remember that this is about fundamental rights. So the right to privacy is intrinsic to who we are, what we do and what we choose. Um, and it's a really interesting question around who owns our data. Um, there was a case last year um, between Discovery and, and Liberty around um, uh, around control of personal information. And some people interpreted that judgment as a clear statement that individuals own their data. And I love that that would be the case, but I don't think the judgment went as far as that. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done in understanding the context of the right to privacy in South Africa, testing the scope of our privacy rights. Um, and really, I think we all have a role to play as civil society, as activists, as interested parties to raise awareness about these rights and make sure that people know that they have entitlements and those and recourse where that privacy is not being protected. Thank you very much, Avani. Uh, I think we all couldn't agree with you more. There's a need for privacy literacy. There's a need for data literacy, Murray, and people who work in this area you, you, yourself, and uh, to spread it much more broadly uh, amongst uh, people, because everybody is, as we now know, vulnerable to uh, uh, surveillance and to erosion of autonomy through erosion of, of, of privacy. It, Salia says, I wish the information regulator was present here. Uh, I do too, um, next time. Um, uh, but again, that's an institution that I think very few people are, are aware of, uh, very people who, few people who need to know. So, so thank you everybody for what I hope uh, the people who've joined us have found to be a rich uh, discussion. I've certainly found it very, very informative in a whole number of uh, uh, respects, the information that came out. Thank you, Garan. Thank you, Avani. Thank you, Murray. Thank you, Section 27, for putting this on, and in particular, uh, Julia Chastelson for doing uh, the work in getting us all together and making the system work. And so, everybody, stay safe. We're in a difficult time in the country again with new infections, as Murray and everybody said. 
take government's uh, public health uh, instructions and advice uh, very, very seriously because your and other people's lives will depend upon it. Thank you very much. That's the end of today. Thanks.